All right, folks, welcome to another edition of the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. Here at a podcasting home of Amedios, and uh, we are going to be joined by a wonderful guest this week, uh, someone who's, uh, I imagine, going to be catching up on a lot of rest here uh, just a little bit. A uh, very busy weekend for our, our guest. Uh, I always kind of keep it a little bit of a, a secret at the top of the show, as though you can't see the show description or, or anything like that. It's not a huge Huge secret, uh, but we'll bring him on here in just a second. But, um, you know, I, I often do reach out to Dave uh, Parker and, and just get ideas on what to promote. And Dave actually kind of changed things up a little bit this week and suggested that folks, um, if you haven't already, go out and uh, follow Amedios on their social platforms. Um, you know, I, I'm a big Twitter user. So if you're a Twitter uh, user like me, you would go to Adam Medios Raleigh. Um, I'm not a huge Instagram guy, so uh, I, I might need a, a little um, help, uh, you know, digging up what the Amedios uh, Instagram page is. But I, Dave tells me they're on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So, um, you know, always a great place to, you know, keep up with the Amedios there on social media, find out, uh, you know, specials, things that are going on. You know, um, if you're looking for, you know, it, it, it from a social media standpoint, it, all, it always helps if you're, you know, just sitting at home and figuring out dinner plans. You might see a, an Amedios tweet come across the timeline and say, oh, yeah, it's date night. Let's uh, let's head on down to Amedios and grab some uh, fine or, Italian cuisine. Or kids night every Monday night. That's right. Come kids out to night. the podcast. You know? That's right. Come out to the podcast. <laughs> watch watch a little uh, uh, podcast and, uh, you know, let your kid eat for free here at Amedios. Um, but, yeah, give uh, if you're on Twitter, give them a follow at Amedios Raleigh. Uh, search them up on Facebook and Instagram, and, uh, you know, that'll help you stay in tune with everything that's going on here at Amedios. And, Corey, I know that you uh, are probably going to give a, a quick read for the uh, the Scott Wood uh, sponsorship. Uh, Scott, friend of the show, <clears throat> I'm sure he's as, as heartbroken as the rest of Wolfpack Nation about the uh, the fact that we bowed out a little bit early, but, uh, but, but go ahead and hit him with the spot, Scott Wood spot here. Yeah. As you were speaking, I was having to pull it back up. Uh, the Scott Wood home living team. Uh, is there anything this man can't do after a successful career at NC state and playing professional basketball? Scott has turned his sights on concrete in the mortgage world. Reach out to him today. If you're interested in financing the purchase or build of your dream home, looking to purchase your first investment property, or even just to buy land. As an ever-present face in the community, his large network base can help connect you to the perfect builders and realtors out there to make your buying slash building experience as seamless as possible. His vast product base allows for each customer to receive their own tailored loan to fit their needs from the traditional W-2 earner to the unique self-employed business owner. So home ownership is much closer than you might think. Great rates in 50 states. Yes, you heard that right. The ability to lend in all 50 states. Unlimited range. Yes, Sorry. as always. <laughs> <laughs> Scott is looking forward to sending out those pre-approvals and getting your home journey started. So thanks as always, Scott, for, for sponsoring the show here. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had our guests sit here uh, patiently as we go through all of our ad reads. And uh, I know he's a fan of Amedios as well. Uh, so uh, he's not with us this week, but uh, he's been with us before here at Amedios, and we're happy to welcome him back on. Coach Pat Papalizio is joining us. Yeah, I'm sorry. All is good. I'm jealous you guys get to eat some good Italian food. You know, I was eating uh, well, steaks out in, in Oklahoma, so I missed the good, good Italian food. I heard there was a really good burger joint as well. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you had a burger with Jonas or not. No, he got to uh, enjoy probably a little more of the restaurants and local flavor than we were, uh, than we, we were able to do. So we'll, we'll catch up on it another time. Yeah, you weren't there for a sightseeing visit. You had some business no. to take care of uh, while you were there out in Tulsa. Yep. Um, uh, so state goes out, um, you know, finishes in the the top ten. Uh, I think the I think I saw this was what the ninth straight year you guys have finished in the top twenty. I hope I got my numbers right on that. Um, you know, just broadly, we'll we'll get into the individual results here in just a second. But just kind of give us an overall evaluation on how the team did uh, on the whole and and things you were pleased with, or maybe, you know, uh, if you were a little bit disappointed with how things played out as well. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing is if we rewind from, uh, a year ago after NCAAs, when we had Hayden and Tariq and a couple other guys that obviously were in our lineup that moved on, you know, we lost a lot of leadership and talent and point scorers at the NCAA tournament. And, 
we basically had to hit the reset button and kind of start from scratch with, you know, who's going to be the next guy that can go out there and, and place pretty high at the NCAA tournament. Uh, obviously, Trent was coming back, and, you know, he's been a staple for our program. And we knew he was going to go out and compete at a high level. But, you know, when you go back to November and you look at our lineup, a lot of people question it if we could hang in there where we've been the last couple of years. And I'm just proud of the fact that the guys who uh, represent NC State showed up, compete, and uh, continue to move this program in the right direction. And I look at, you know, this weekend in Tulsa as a success with – basically eight underclassmen that are in our lineup that have two more years or more. And uh, I think we're going to be a dangerous team moving forward when, when it comes to scoring points at the NCAA tournament. So overall, you know, you get, you get in the middle of things and, and it becomes a grind and your expe expectations stay pretty high. Um, you always want to achieve excellence and, you know, the ultimate goal is to win a national title. And, and when you don't do that, you know, some people can can be a little disappointed in that, but I, I'm not looking at it like that. I'm looking at it like we, we made a lot of growth this year, and to me that's what this program and this year was about, you know, continuing to improve and, and hold the standard of what NC State wrestling is all about. And these, this 10 guys that are, were on this team at the ACC tournament and the nine that went to NCAs were all about that. Well, I was going to say, you mentioned, you know, trying to figure out who's going to step up and who's going to take on those roles to compete for, you know, a national championship in the next couple of years. It seemed like Kyrie Rainey was somebody that, you know, I think going into the season, a lot of people expected to be, you know, a, a strong wrestler for this team, but have you even been shocked by the results that he's had so far this season? And, you know, what he, what he care I say so far this season, like the season isn't over, but care and, and now carrying that into next year too. Um. You know, I, yeah, I guess you can look at the beginning of the year, you know, first dual meet out against App State, he takes a loss and people start questioning, you know, where's the development, where's he at? And, you know, it was a rough start for him in the beginning of the year. But as time went on and, and he got focused, um, continued to improve and got super disciplined by the end of the year. Um, he's super talented. It's It's been fun to watch in our room. He's, you know, obviously been a, a guy that gets to work out with Camacho Trombley and Kevin Jack, or Ryan Jack, um, Kevin as well, but not not on the team. Um, so you, you see all the things happen in the room, and you know the ability and the level he's at, and just transitioning that to competition. Um, he did a really good job this weekend doing that, and it's been a fun success story for Kyrie being here at NC State. You cut. You mentioned you had, uh, you know, some upper class or excuse me, underclassmen in, and you feel like the table is set nicely for this, you know, the years to come. Um, what growth, uh, in addition to, to Kai's growth over the course of the years, what what other growth stories, whatever success stories, were you able to kind of uh, pinpoint as the year progressed that gives you the hope that you have for the years to come? Well, you know, I think perfect example when you have a true freshman in your lineup you know, gets the call right away, um, went through the grind of a D1 season. Uh, Jackson Arrington, you know, 49, you know, in the beginning of the year, he was straight out of high school and didn't have any college experience. And, you know, you saw it happen through the year. He had some good wins, wasn't able to beat, you know, any of the top elite guys that, you know, All-American the years past. He, he had some really tough, challenging losses. But he was in every match of the year, um, and then he gets in the round of 12, and, and he wrestled his tail off this weekend for us, and, and it showed, um, you know, the, uh, someone like that coming from the background that he has, being a national champ when or All-American when it was in Fargo. Um, it showed when he was out there competing in the round of 12. You know, he was probably 10 seconds away from closing that match out, and I know it didn't sit well with him. And it, it, it's kind of like what Ed Scott did a year ago. You know, was super disappointed, didn't get, didn't get on the podium and worked his tail off for a whole year to make sure that he was able to place this year. And I'm confident Jackson Arrington is going to be a guy doing the same thing this offseason. I know you've had some time to kind of reflect on it now and obviously move on from it. But, you know, was there any frustration for the team overall that, that Maddie wasn't able to make it as well? Because obviously, you know, there was a chance to have – 
all 10 guys there and competing to, you know, get a higher than 10th place finish as well? Well, I guess there's uh, pros and cons to it all with him not qualifying. The, uh, the pro of it all is he actually broke his hand in the ACC tournament and wouldn't have been able to compete anyways. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously the con is not having the experience of it, but we, uh, we felt, you know, it was his decision at the end of the year if he wanted to go and give it a shot. He agreed that he wanted to wrestle in the ACC tournament and have the chance to wrestle at NCA. So as a coaching staff, we, we left it in the athlete's hands and, you know, ultimately it didn't play out in, in his favor. But I think the valuable experience and the disappointment of not accomplishing your goals is, is very important in our sport to keep guys motivated and hungry. And it's all about the response and how you deal with adversity, um, whether it's, you know, the round of 12 or not getting to the tournament. And, you know, we've had multiple guys do multiple things, whether it's all American or a guy like Mike mock who never qualified. And then he qualifies, doesn't play, you know, so we use all these experiences to motivate guys and we've been through it. We've done it, but now it comes down to how the athlete responds and what are they willing to do this off season? Talk about uh, Trent. He obviously ran into uh, Aaron Brooks again uh, at, you know, I'm sure he's happy to see Aaron move on uh, from uh, his career in Penn State. But um, was he um, – what was his uh, mentality coming out of that match against Aaron? I mean, obviously disappointed he didn't, didn't get a chance to wrestle for a national title. But um, was he overall positive with his uh, trip to Tulsa? I, you know, those guys are, are built to win. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't accomplish your goal – it's obviously devastating to a guy like Trent. He he has done everything in his power and his ability to put himself in position to win a national title. And it comes with the territory of any sport, any athlete. Um, you know, that just comes with competition. And if you don't win, you're, you know, you, you take it to heart. And it's only going to motivate him. Um, you know, he'll continue to get back to the drawing board and, and keep working. And you got to seize the opportunity when you get him. And, it's going to motivate and fuel him to get ready and better for next year, regardless of who he has to compete against. He's a true competitor and has done phenomenal things for our program and sport of wrestling. But, you know, his, his ultimate goal is to win a national title. And until that happens, you know, I don't think he's going to be satisfied in, in any way, shape or form as far as he operates as a human being. And I know you mentioned the, you know, the frustration for Ed Scott last year, you know, obviously didn't get to his ultimate goal of trying to you know, compete for a national championship this year, but um, in the third OT, you know, gets that takedown to be able to, you know, get all American honors. What was that moment like and, and seeing everything kind of come to fruition in, you know, in only his second year, basically at NC state. Yeah, no, it was huge. Um, you saw the, the mental stress that he went through last year, you know, not placing and it's devastating as a coach an athlete to, to be a part of that. It's even probably harder on parents who have to deal with their kids. Um, so when you see that happen, it's just a relief of joy. Um, and you, you know how much work these guys put in and even, even the guys are competing against. So they're, you know, it's tough to, to know that at the end of the day, when you get in that round of 12, someone's devastated, someone's excited. And I was just happy, you know, a guy like Ed, got through because he, he did, he went to work right away after last year and the disappointment that he faced and he did something about it. And that's the biggest thing with these guys is, are you going to, are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to dwell and, and feel sorry for yourself? And, you know, that's comes with the territory of the sport. You know, you gotta, you gotta man up and, and continue to get better and deal with the adversity and the challenges that were, brought against these guys and, and most of them have been able to do that for us. And it, it's just rewarding when you see guys be able to step up and get that, that big win in the round of 12 or quarterfinals. I mean, coach, obviously you're bringing in guys, high character guys, guys that you know that will respond even to, you know, disappointment or adversity. But, you know, as the off season approaches here, is there anything that you as a staff or you personally do, you know, to try to, um, you know, assist guys who have dealt with a disappointment um, or had a disappointing season. Do you have to do a whole lot of off-season coaching, or, or is it mostly on the the individual wrestler to get themselves right and prepare for the upcoming season? 
Well, every year is different. You know, if you look over the years past, we got everyone back multiple years. So, you know, a lot of it was super motivated guys and a lot of them helping each other. This last off season, I will say the coaching staff really put a lot of hard work and commitment into development. And it showed this year because we, we did, we lost a lot. We lost a lot of leadership. We brought in, you know, a ton of freshmen and it's, it's a challenge at times. Um, and knowing your team and knowing what they need is, I think, very valuable. And our, and our coaching staff did a phenomenal job of, of executing that and really developing guys this year and putting us in position to repeat as ACC champs. And, you know, if you'd have told me a year ago we were going to be top 10 like we were with the team that we had last year, you know, I don't think many people would have counted us in for that. But I think the guys t- took a personal in that room and wanted to prove people wrong and, and showed up and did something about it. So, yeah, we, you know, we, we got to do a lot of work this off season. We got to continue to get better and develop, but we, we have high expectations within our program and we realize, you know, finishing tenth is, is good and all, but we want to bring team trophies home. Yeah. I was going to ask you, you mentioned earlier, all the, all the uh, wrestlers that are coming back for next year. Uh, and at this point, obviously you can look at it and, know that you have guys not only for next year, but the following year too, in most cases, uh, how confident are you going into next year that you can repeat the success of, you know, the regular season and the ACC championships and, and work towards, you know, NCAAs next year as well? Yeah. Um, first of all, I have a lot of confidence in, in one, our staff and the guys and our support system around us, but it's a new year and, you can look across the board and, you know, you, you saw the upsets that happened at the NCAA tournament. So if you think, you know, if you place this year, you're guaranteed it next year, that's not true. You know, you got to go out and earn everything and you got to put the same amount of work, if not more, you know, these guys are going to have a target on their back and they need to train like that. They need to show up and, and continue to have the same discipline and, you know, work at work ethic that has been instilled in them and not be content. And, you know, that's one thing I think we do a good job within our program is not allowing that to happen. So I feel pretty good going into next year, knowing that we're going to have some really good firepower. And um, I'm excited to get a couple guys back and a couple guys off red shirt. And I think it's going to be a dangerous combo for NC State wrestling. Have there any been any guys on the roster who uh, have, you know, declared one way or the other? Or is there anyone uh, at this point? I know you have largely a team of, of – underclassmen so i'm you anticipate getting you know most of them back but is there anybody that was kind of on the fence that you have heard from or yet to make a decision on some of that stuff well most of them have two years left so you know we're dealing with a lot of guys that have two years of eligibility left um trent's the only one that's got one year left and you know i think it's no secret that he's back and and is, wants to win a national title uh alex Faison's another one that you know He's in the military with ROTC. He's really considering it. We have to have an in-depth conversation, but his uh, timeline is a lot different. It's not a yes or no. Yeah, I want to do this. I think it's more about his career path with the military. Um, sure. So I think if, if something could get worked out with him, you know, that would have an impact on our 74 for next year. So we'll see. You know, this week will be an important week having those conversations, but. You know, as far as everyone that scored points at the NCAA tournament, they're all back for next year, you know, and, and hopefully we can get a guy like Alex Faison back. And I just – I like the development and the improvements that he's had, and he's been a great impact on our, on our team this this, pack, this past year. And it would be fun to see a guy that finally gets a full year of experience, uh, what kind of improvements he can throw in the lineup next year if he was able and willing to come back. And I wanted to ask you, too, I mean, just as a general kind of overlook, you just concluded your 11th season with NC State. You had three national champions at this point, uh, multiple NCAA finalists, uh, 27 All-Americans now at this point, I believe 28 or 29 ACC champions. I mean, how how proud are you of the program that you've built at NC State and where things stand heading into next year? Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, that that's not on me. That's on the – you know, the support system and, and the athletes that have come here and bought into what we're about and what we're trying to accomplish. But I'm more impressed with the, the continued support through the Wolfpack fans that show up and support our guys. 
you know, I, I hear it and see it, you know, people, they want to win a national title here at NC state. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter what sport it is. Um, and I, I really do believe wrestling is a sport that could get that done here. I know we have a lot of work to do on our end, but having that support system from our fans is critical and very impactful. Um, and I just want to make sure we continue to represent, you know, NC State Athletics and NC State University with, you know, first class and, and our guys represent them and, and do the right things on and off the mat, which we will continue to do. I was going to say it's not even just about the success. It's about the culture as well. I mean, you can go to Reynolds any Friday night and it's packed. I mean, for the most part, you know, obviously early season matches are a little different, but uh, you know, when it gets to ACC wrestling and when you get to, you know, you look at everything else that's been built around it as well, where you have the Wolfpack wrestling and all the guys competing for, you know, Team USA, things along those lines. I mean, how proud are you of, of that element as well in all of this? Uh, you know, uh, again, it goes back to helping the guys accomplish their goals. So it's rewarding, um, you know, always proud of any guy that puts on the singlet and competes because I know they're ready. And we've done our job as coaches to put them in that position. So it's it's very rewarding when you see guys get their hand raised that have done all the right things leading up to that day of competition. And then when it finally happens for them, you know, that's that's what we signed up for. And, you know, there's this weekend alone, there's so much emotion, just it drains you. You know, when you see guys, one, when they win. You want to celebrate with them, but you turn around a minute later and the guy's devastated because he took a loss. So you don't have much time to, to really think about things as, as you process everything. It, it happens fast, but um, there's nothing better than than watching a guy get his hand, hand raised with a NC State singlet or a Wolfpack offseason singlet and, and putting themselves in position to, you know, to compete at the highest level. Yeah, my follow-up question to what Corey just said is, you know, um, I, I'm curious if you've at your time here at NC State, if you've been able to to feel or perceive the um, the perception of NC State as a program when you head out to championships Are you know, are fans from other fan bases viewing, you know, your your team, your the wrestlers who are wearing that Wolfpack singlet, are, are they viewing them in a different light from your perspective uh, to where, you know, 10 years ago or so? Yeah, I, I do believe, um, you know, first of all, you can tell from our scheduling. Um, a lot of people respect us because they're unwilling to come to Reynolds and compete against us. So, right. Uh, that's not a lack of trying on, on, a, on my end. That's, uh, I think, just our guys showing up and competing at elite level. And, and, you know, let's face it, if you're wrestling a guy with an NC State singlet on, you know you're going to be in for a battle. Um, you know, sometimes they might not be the most talented, most athletic guy, but I can promise you they're going to fight you for seven minutes and not ever quit and stop competing. And I think that's our mentality. That's our culture. And anyone that puts that single on kind of carries that pride now. And I think it is, I think across the country, people know, you know, that NC State is perennial top 10 program and we're going to continue to to push to make sure we're in that same setting. Yeah, I hadn't considered how difficult it must make your job putting together a schedule every year when yeah. <laughs> you're trying to, it's you tough. know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, every the, the the problem of every successful program, right? Trying to figure out <laughs> how, how to get to those big draws in the door uh, to, to wrestle you guys when they know that they've got a decent chance of uh, not coming away with a win. Um, well, I'm curious, Coach, like, uh, for you and the staff, uh, you know, you're, I guess, heading into uh, the off season. Do you have a window of time that you consider like your downtime, your availability to just kind of relax a little bit? You, you don't strike me as a guy who takes a whole lot of downtime, but uh, you know, what, what, what does a Pat Pabellizio do to just kind of relax and, and uh, enjoy the off season? Well, the, the reality is there, there really isn't an off season anymore. You know, we're going, this next weekend, you'll run right into high school nationals, which, you know, someone from NC State will be there. And then we're, we're less than a month away from the U.S. Open, which I think we have probably six guys in the senior level and, you know, six or seven guys in the 20 and under. So it's going to be a really busy offseason, as always, and recruiting doesn't stop. Um, 
you know, reality is probably sometime in August, things might slow down a little bit, but since we're in the off season, you know, I guess the luxury is, is we're not practice every Saturday and Sunday. So a weekend off is like a week off in college. <laughs> right. So that, that's, uh, that's hard for people to understand, but when you get a weekend off and you don't have to travel or compete and you're not, you know, it's hard, you know, we, we wrestle dual meet on a, on a Friday. You don't go to bed that night cause you're processing so many, so many things. And even our guys on our team, a lot of them, you know, it's hard to fall asleep. And so, the, you know, the weekends kind of bleed together with the weekdays. So now the season's over, you at least get two days to recover. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pat, we, we appreciate it as always, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. We always love having the opportunity to, to speak with you. So yeah, same. All right. Well, uh, let's take a break here on the pack pride weekly podcast. Thank you, coach. Yeah. Thank you. Get a, get a dish of lasagna for me. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Congrats again on a great season. And you squeeze it in there right at the I, I, Look at you go. <laughs> Congrats on a great season. All right. I know you guys weren't hearing us out of the speaker. I don't know what the story was there. Uh, so, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 He, you you almost would prefer a show where it's just Pat and and not either one of us. Okay, we'll just kind of fill in the blanks on on yeah. what the questions may have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it happens too with obviously with other programs. Like I mean, you know, North Carolina not great across the board, but having a guy like Austin O'Connor probably helped in their you know, neck of the woods too. So it helps with the entire you know neighborhood as well. So, yeah. And I was just thinking today, like it would be great if NC state could fire up their lacrosse programs again, because lacrosse is really taken off as a sport here yeah. locally high, in the high school level. So I, I, yeah, I want to, I want to spend every dollar the athletics budget has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to spend Eddie's money. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right. Well, uh, b- basketball in the second segment. Yes, and, sir. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, just and just white noise. To what? Swimming. Dive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, men's. Yes. So, so you guys might have kept up a little better than I did. The on the men's side, I mean, where do they stand as far as the rankings going into swimming and diving? No, this coming up weekend. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like they have a shot to compete for a national championship this coming up weekend. Yeah, we I should mean, probably discuss. Yeah, yeah. Trey Turner also good at baseball. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he only hit what a grand slam, and then did he have two run home run? No, but did he? What was the first one? Was it a solo home run? So he hit a grand slam, a two run home run, and a and a three run home run. So he just needs a solo in the for the home run cycle. Yeah, to hit the home run cycle in the in the World Baseball Classic. <laughs> yeah, he's batting ninth. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, also. You also basically have a second leadoff guy. They're getting a treat. I mean, because you have, you know, if he gets on base and then you're, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your number one batter gets on base. You have two guys that can steal. You can pull a double steal. So, yeah. Well, if you're watching on YouTube live, you're getting a, a peek behind the curtain at our in between segments yes. banter that is world renowned. <laughs> Dictating which way <laughs> you guys are going to listen to the podcast. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why that one cracked me up. Um, we are here in the media, as mentioned. Uh, always great to talk, talk with Coach Pat Popolizio. I, I managed to make the entire segment without a single mispronunciation, I think. So, uh, so proud of you. I avoided, 
Because you avoid... didn't mention Owen this time, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tried to avoid some of the trickier last names. Um, but uh, congrats to them and a strong performance there out in Tulsa. I, you know, I was looking up um, the results, past prior year results for, you know, teams, and it's just amazing what Penn State has done in the last decade and a half. I mean, they just, they're dominant. And yeah. I, I was tempted to ask about what, what can an NC State do to dethrone a, a Penn State, but I'm sure that that uh, is something that he and his staff are actively working on uh, each and every day. Uh, and there's, you know, a hundred other programs out there trying to figure out the same thing as well. It's exactly what they did last year. I mean, it's it's doing the exact same thing they did last offseason. It's developing the guys that you have because mm -hmm. the guys that they have right now have all all have a shot to you know compete for All American next year. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it, and some of it's just getting over that mental hurdle. You know, it's it's right. not the physical. It's it's the mental hurdle of a guy like Ryan Jack. You know competing and getting to all American honors. Cause he, he bowed out last year early, did a similar thing this year and wasn't able to kind of get back in, you know, the constellation of blood rounds. So um, you hope to see continued success from guys like that. And for them to, to push forward, because this is a team that, that very well could have finished top five this year, if not for a few upsets and if not for, you know, seeing a few guys bow out a little bit earlier than they expected. So uh, if those guys all get over the, the mental hurdle and develop physically this upcoming year, uh, you get the sense that each and every single one of them has a chance to to push forward and, and get 10 guys next year as well. Yeah. And I I had it up earlier. I don't have it up now, but I think state, uh, as far as ACC teams that finished in the ranks, I think Virginia Tech finished just ahead of NC State in the yes. rankings, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, Carolina finished outside of the, uh, the top 10. But uh, – you know, another uh, another solid year of ACC wrestling in the books, and and yeah, it's it's a daunting task. But you're right. I think you know, just getting guys over some of those mental hurdles and and continuing to develop is is how teams like Penn State do it every year. Would love to see Trent win a national championship next year too. I feel yeah. like he's somebody that's been on the cusp every single year, and for whatever reason, just runs into Aaron Brooks. And I mean, there's a reason why Aaron Brooks is a three time national champion. So right, uh, love to see him do that next year, and that that alone probably pushes them, you know, inside the top five. If you get somebody like that to win a national championship next year. So, right. uh, yeah, they're, they're right on the cusp, but I mean, look, they, they could very well get right on that uh, next year with all the guys that you have coming back. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, switch gears. Uh, this is our first podcast after uh, the opening weekend of the NCAA tournament for both men and women. Um, disappointing results. Um, you know, uh, I think perhaps more disappointing on the women's side. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get into to both here. Uh, let's start with the men uh, and, and a positive note to, to enter into this discussion. Um, you know, probably the last time that we'll see Traquavion Smith play at NC State, but he picked one hell of a game to go out on. Um, really did just about everything one player can do to try to will his team to victory in, in his performance. Um, I listened to some of uh, you and Brian's conversation on the uh, after the game, shortly afterwards. Um, at that at that time, y'all didn't know that Creighton had beaten Baylor to advance to the Sweet 16. Yeah. So that takes a little bit of the sting out, knowing that uh, we we lost to the uh, the team who advanced into the next weekend. Uh, but you know, it uh, it's it still stings because it was there uh, in many ways for NC State to. Uh, you know, to get into it if they had just, uh, you know, shot better. Both teams struggled shooting uh, from from behind the arc. But, um, again, I want to bring it back to Truquavion and start there because he really just had a, a tremendous, what we assume will be final game at NC State. Yeah, I mean, there was some clear frustration from Truquavion. Outside of the Virginia Tech game over the last, like, six or seven games of the year, he had, he had shot pretty poorly and, you know, didn't live up to his own standards, uh, much less what, you know, people expected of him going into several of those games. And, uh, for him to, you know, to finish on that kind of note, uh, you know, obviously the the efficiency, you know, you can question it however you want to, but I mean, there there was several stretches there, especially in the second half where it felt like he couldn't miss, uh, and there was times where you know he would drive if he was missing, he was he was drawing a foul. He went seven of eight from the free throw line in the second half, uh, eight of nine overall. Uh, so. You know, just a, a really strong game from him if that if that is going to be ultimately his final game, which it more than likely will be. Uh, and, you know, again, I mean, it wasn't a great game from him, but 
Uh, shout out to Jarko Joiner for the year that he had at NC State. Yes, uh, that's going to be his final year. He has he's the only player on the NC State roster that doesn't have a chance of eligibility for next year. Um, obviously, going into the year, Dusan Mohorčić was also another guy there. Uh, but you know, Dusan Mohorčić uh, has a chance of getting a medical waiver for next year. So mm -hmm. uh, all of those things uh, could you know could play into next year. And you could again, you know, as we were just talking with Pat Popolizio about it, you know, there's there's a very good chance that you know you could have a ton of uh, successful guys coming back that that help lift you to this point, uh, and and all of those guys could come back next year. So uh, we'll see what how the roster shakes out. But you know, as and, and going back to your point about you know Creighton beating Baylor, uh, I feel like you know we we didn't have a podcast last week, but I did have a podcast with with Brian and uh, Miles last week, and those people during the podcast and those people. You know, listening back to the podcast that seemed a little pissy with us about the fact that, you know, we talked so much about Creighton and, you know, pumped up Creighton and all this different stuff. And and one of the reasons why we did that was because we're trying to let people know, like, look, this was a team that should have been you mm. know, potentially a top two or top three seed, if not for uh, their big man, Ryan Kalkbrenner, you know, having catching mono midway through the season. They lost, you know, six games in a row, mm -hmm. uh, and that ended up leading to, you know, them them being you know, a team that was perceived as a, a down team compared to what they should have been as a top ten team pr prior to the season. So, uh, you know, between them and Arkansas, both of them proved in the NCAA tournament early on why they were a, a preseason top ten team and uh, and showed out. Unfortunately for NC State, you ended up uh, running into that. Uh, and you know they didn't they didn't have a defense for Ryan Kalkbrenner, especially with DJ Burns, right. uh, you know going through foul trouble. Regardless of the fact that he wasn't playing well defensively in that game, which it's really hard to play against, uh, you know, a seven foot one big man that that can drive and uh, you know separate. I, I a big part of that was the fact that you had DJ Burns in foul trouble throughout the game uh, and couldn't get things going offensively on the other end inside so it put so much of the pressure on guys like Jarko Joyner, Traquavion Smith and Casey Morsell as well. Yeah, part of your discussion with uh Brian revolved around the fact that you know because you didn't have Dusan Mohorsic and you didn't have Greg Gant, it you know a a relatively thin front line was, you know, pretty much everything fell on DJ's shoulders yeah. to defend uh an elite big man uh who um, while he may not have the weight on DJ, uh, he has the, side, the the height advantage on DJ. And, um, you know, I, I I was frustrated at times with DJ picking up some some poor fouls, the one where he shoved basically Kalkbrenner in the back. Yeah. You know, his fourth foul, I think, was really ticky-tack and, and should not have been called. But, you know, that should have been his third foul and not his fourth. Um, but for the, the kind of the silly one he picked up there and, and – um, you know, I, I, I feel badly for DJ because he struggled down the stretch. He had, he had some, you know, poor games, didn't have a great ECC tournament, um, and did not, uh, obviously have a great game in, in the only, uh, game in the NCAA tournament after having such a, a spectacular, you know, mid season or ACC season. Um, you know, uh, it, it just, uh, it's unfortunate the way that, uh, it played out, but a lot was being asked of him, uh, both defensively. You know, Kalkbrenner being a guy who um, I don't think shoots a tremendous number of threes, but even in that game, he nailed one yeah. at the top of the key. And and not, I guess what you wouldn't say, a, a stretch five, but uh, he did put uh, DJ in some tough defensive uh, positions. And um, you could just tell. And again, I, I don't think the team, um, you know, was suffering too much from the altitude uh, effects, but for a guy like DJ who, who has, uh, you know, conditioning has always been a, uh, a weak suit in his game to, to deal with some of the issues at altitude. You could, you could tell he, and, and some of the other guys too, were, were, uh, gassed at times and, um, just a tough ask for DJ and, and an unfortunate way that his season uh, ended there. Um, and again, uh, your point to Jarkel, his, his year concluding his season concluding, um, uh, on, on not the best game as well. I, I felt for, for him, you know, there was that sequence where, you know, uh, Turquavion throws down maybe his best dunk at NC state. Yeah. Um, and then gets a tremendous block on the other end. He, he feeds Jarkel on the outlet. And if that shot goes down, you know, the momentum surge from that, who knows what happens after that point, I think, cause that might've cut it to a one point game. Yeah. Maybe? 
and you know the frustrating part about that too is i so i, I went to shoot around the day before mm-hmm. and it was the first time we've been you know allowed to shoot around luckily you know the NCAA tournament allows you to do that uh went to shoot around the day before and i kid you not like everybody's you know shooting their shot kind of you know going around Jarkel from that exact point, mm-hmm. exact point he took that shot over and over and over again. And I posted a video of it too. I mean, he probably hit like 13 of 14 mm. from that exact spot. And every single time he shot it, just screaming out cash, like o- over and over again. Like <laughs> I know this is going in. And, uh, and for whatever reason, like that one didn't go in. And, and I mean, right once it left his hands, I was just waiting for the place to erupt because that's the one thing that you need in the NCAA tournament when you're the lower seed, right? You know, when you're the 11 seed or you're the 12 seed, whatever you are, you know, in that matchup, you need to get going. And, uh, and with Creighton having, I mean, probably, I'd say probably a fourth of the stadium, uh, was full of Creighton, Creighton fans, Creighton. I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) Creighton fans, uh, Creighton's the rest of them, you know, all of them behind me were NC state fans. There's a ton of them. Mm. Uh, and some of the people here and, and our audience were there as well. And if you get going, all of a sudden, the 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 rest of the crowd is behind you. Sure, yeah. You know, they're they're wanting the upset. They're wanting to see something special happen. And for NC State, they just weren't unfortunately able to get that kind of momentum. They weren't. You know, they got the lead, but it never really felt you know stable. Um, and and I think that was that was the one thing they were missing in this game was if you hit that kind of shot, you get yourself back in it. Uh, that's when the entire crowd gets behind you again. And uh, yeah, I hated it for, for not only the team, but you know, for Jarkel in general, because that just felt like that would have been one of those moments. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's waited his entire career to get to the NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, he's played two years at uh, out in California and then played another two years with Ole Miss never once even sniffing the NCAA tournament. Uh, he finally gets there and and that felt like, Man, if he would have just made that, like right. that would have that would have propelled you know him into the discussion of like one of the better players for NC State in the NCAA tournament too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe even NC State doesn't finish that game, but by hitting that shot, he would have, uh, you know, capped what just would have been an amazing momentum swing. And yeah, um, and you're right. You know, when you're a lower seed, uh, everyone's rooting for you. And you know, a because it's exciting to see a, a potential upset, but two, you know, altruistically, uh, you know. Uh, your team, you know, you presume that uh, your team's going to have a better shot against uh, the 11 seed if they advance, um, even though it's kind of counterproductive because you're watching a team uh, outperform above their seed level. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just exciting and and to have the uh, the crowd. I mean, I will say there were a tremendous number of NC State fans there in Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many were folks who live locally to the Colorado area and how many were folks who flew out and traveled to, to be there. But, uh, you know, uh, there I could pick up a few uh, times the Wolfpack chant broke out on TV, which was which was great to hear. So um, NC State fans represented really well out there. And it's just a shame that uh, they didn't get a chance to play Baylor, um, you know, uh the, the plus side of losing to the team who advances to the Sweet 16 is that you you know that you lost to a good team. The downside is that um, you feel like you could have been that team that could have knocked off Baylor on a down night. So yeah, I was talking with uh, with several people before the game even even got started uh, on Friday that were like, I feel better about NC State's chances to beat Baylor than I do about Creighton. Right, and you know, you just but unfortunately, you don't get to that matchup. You you have to. You know, beat Creighton in order to advance, and and Creighton is a team that has you know four potential NBA guys on their on their roster, uh, and I mean that's a reason why a lot of people pick them as a you know a, a dark horse to make the Final Four, uh, mm-hmm. and you know unfortunately for NC State you weren't able to to upset them and uh, you know in that potential run and, and break all those brackets, but uh, man I mean just you know I, obviously there's been a you know really dark side of this uh, after losing there's been a you know, outpouring of love from NC State fans, you know, for the team in general. But then there's been the opposite of that, you know, mostly on social media of people just, you know, attacking the team, attacking Kevin Keats for, you know, not, uh, you know, not winning a game. Obviously, he's still at zero ACC or NCAA wins in his career, uh, which is a frustrating point for him. 
Uh, but at the same time, he's also, you know, gotten themselves close uh, multiple times and just hasn't been able to push through. So I think right now for him, he wants to get back to the NCAA tournament. Uh, when I spoke to Bucor again about this on Saturday or on Friday night, you know, immediately said, we've gotten to this point. Now we want to get to the next stage. Now mm -hmm. we want to get to, and that's that I think is what uh, they want to do this upcoming year. You know, yes, there's frustration that you still have a one NCAA tournament team, uh, NCAA tournament game. But right now, well, looking hindsight has to be 2020 here. You have to look back and figure out like, hey, this is a team that wasn't even expected to make it to the NCAA tournament. Mm -hmm. And now you're just completely pouring it on them for not winning an NCAA tournament game. Uh, I think you can get frustrated next year about that, but this is a team that just fought their <laughs> butts off uh, to even get to this point uh, and, you know, completely retooled everything. Uh, now you can go into this offseason and say, all right, this is this is what we have to offer to transfers. I mm -hmm. uh, saw a question, somebody saying, uh, I think it was uh, David here that said, are we seeking any true point guards in the portal this offseason? Only three assists and a loss to Creighton on Friday. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, obviously you're going to be going after another point guard. You also have Trey Parker coming in this offseason that I think can fill that role at times if you need him. Uh, but, you know, another thing I will I will say as well, you had two guys that were averaging, you know, over three assists per game. You had one that had a double-double this season. It wasn't from a lack of trying to get assists. There was quite a few missed shots, unfortunately, in this game, especially three-pointers where you dish it out to wide-open guys and they just missed three-pointers. Yeah, uh, And there was a lot of times where, you know, Turquavion had to go into takeover mode. So uh, that's not going to lead to a ton of assists. And he filled it pretty well. So uh, I, I do think they're going to have to go out and get a point guard, but I don't think it's – I don't know. I, I think the recency effect a lot of times people take into account a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at it and you go, oh, there was only three assists in this entire game. Yes, there was some frustrating games where they weren't able to, you know, get a ton of assists this year. Uh, but – it's not to say this team wasn't uh, passing the ball or wasn't trying to, uh, you know, get an offense going. Uh, yes, that, that happened a lot last year and that was frustrating. Uh, but let's not all just kind of like pinpoint one thing on, on this team or one thing on the Kevin Keats era and say that like, it's just never going to happen because it did happen multiple times this year. Yeah. I think you and Brian in your conversation after the game, Brian pointed out, um, I think uh, Turquavion had over a 50% usage rate, which for, for folks who don't know, that means the on 50, over 50% 50 of NC State's possessions, it either ended in Turquavion taking a shot, uh, getting fouled, or you know committing a turnover. So the ball was in his hand a tremendous amount, and he yeah. was you know carrying the team, as we discussed, over 30 points. Um, so, yes, and, and a lot of missed open threes. Again, for both teams, uh, you know, in some respects, if State had missed as poorly as they did from three and Creighton had made all of theirs, it, it would have been a much more decisive victory in Creighton's favor. So, um, you know, it's um, – And that happens when you get down, too, by the way. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Turquavion feels like he has to go into takeover mode. So – and they were down for 33 minutes of this game. So. Yeah. Well, and, and Tur Turquavion, uh, to his credit, did something that I think a lot of NC State fans were asking for, which was to get back to the attack the basket you know, mode that he had demonstrated uh, earlier in the season and, and done so well. He'd kind of gotten a little bit more comfortable with just shooting threes and, and shooting mid-range jumpers and not attacking the basket. He did that against a seven-footer uh, who, you know, um, you know, in some ways uh, – you know, Creighton's defensive style, I was reading about them, you know, they try to limit the number of fouls that they take. So they don't mm -hmm. they don't do a whole lot of swatting at the ball and swiping and and you know, they they want you to take contested shots around the basket, but they're not going to put themselves uh, or put put you on the uh the free throw line. You know, they were in the NCAA. Yeah. And Turquavian and still fell in the way because he was <laughs> yeah. he was running head on, full of steam into Kalkbrenner and you know bouncing off of him in many cases probably or dunking on him yeah yeah or dunking on him um so um kudos to Turquavion for taking uh, advantage of that and getting back to you know the the aggressive Turquavion that we had seen in many times uh during his time here at NC State um again hopefully leaving on a, a good note you mentioned Boo great great video clip of him you know kind of consoling and comforting Turquavion in the, yeah. the locker room after the fact you know, he we did that. He did that to everybody, by the way. Like yeah. he walked around to every single player, and I asked him about it afterwards. And he was like, "It's not about me. It's just about thanking every single one of these players for 
for being a part of this. So, yeah, I think, you know, Boo often gets criticized for not being more visible and out front. But, uh, but this was an opportunity, not an opportunity for him, but like this was a uh, a chance for NC State fans to to see, you know, Boo's presence there in the locker room. And, and again, this is something behind the scenes that the NCAA allowed us to be in the locker room for. Hmm. And otherwise, we wouldn't have known about it. Yeah. So anyway, it goes to show you all the things that we don't know about. Yes. There, there might be doing behind the scenes. Yes, but. yes. There was a lot of venting on Twitter and social media, uh, you know, shortly after the game ended. Um, some by yours truly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a tough loss. Um, but, uh, I'm hopeful that <laughs> I don't know what motion Gil is making here. I think that was a baseball swing, I believe. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. I he think he wasn't they, twisting his wrist though. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. We, there's, we'll get to the, uh, Trey Turner discussion here in just a second. My goodness. Uh, we want to, we want to save something for uh, a positive note to conclude on here. Um, all right, let's talk real quick about the, the women's team. Their season concluded, uh, in in heartbreaking fashion against the Princeton Tigers, um, I watched the end of that game, and you know it was a it was a close game, a competitive game, but you know states up with what five with a minute to go, and you feel like there were eight at one point and gave up a nine zero run. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know I think what makes it more disappointing, I mentioned that as we headed into the discussion, these two results is the fact that it's, it's, it's uncharacteristic for what we've seen West's teams do in recent years. I mean, usually yeah. I know that we're missing diamond Johnson from the lineup, um, but they just, there were uncharacteristic turnovers and, and sloppy play and, and things that came back. I mean, you credit Princeton obviously for making the plays there at the end and, and hitting the big shot to ultimately win it. But um just uh, not used to seeing uh, a Westmore coach team close out a game in that fashion or not close out a game. Yeah. And, you know, we were talking about it with uh, several members of the audience beforehand about the fact that they didn't call a timeout or it didn't foul uh, at the end of the game either uh, for whatever reason. And, you know, if you, if you foul there, you force them to make two shots uh, and, you know, that potentially ties it up, but it, it allows you to set things up for your offense and, and try to get things going with more than four seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they did something very similar last year against Georgia. Yeah. Um, played and, out, played out know, the same. Yep, way. exactly. Allowed them to, you know, heave up a shot. Uh, it was a three-pointer, and, you know, they ended up ultimately winning the game. So this was a, you know, this is, it's frustrating because this is a game that, you know, going into it, I think everybody kind of thought, like, you know, this Princeton team could probably knock them off. This is this is probably, you know, a team that's going to beat them, and you know it's going to be frustrating because they don't have the offensive firepower. Uh, you don't have Diamond Johnson, and then they go out there and they perform as well as they did for, you know, three and a half quarters, uh, and then to have that frustrating of a finish, uh, mm -hmm. to lose the game that way, um, was was upsetting. And I think uh, it's something that they can take into the offseason, you know, and and as it's similar to what Pat said, you know, this is going to have to be an off season of development uh, for this program, because this is a, this is a program that has a lot of young pieces uh, that can be really good and can lead this team. Uh, you lose Jada Boyd, you lose Jakia Brown Turner uh, this off season, but you get a lot of players back that have shown promise this year. Uh, Saniya Rivers, uh, Zaya James, uh, and several others that they come back. Hopefully Diamond Johnson is able to come back to full health next year. Uh, and then, you know, Zoe Brooks, uh, all of the players that you have coming in for this uh, this upcoming class as well. Um, gosh, I'm blanking on everybody here. I know, obviously, Zoe Brooks, uh, Lacey Steele, uh, and then uh, Maddie Cox, and I'm forgetting one in the middle here, uh, a, a big that they have coming in next year, a post player next year. So all of those players coming in are all top 75, along with the experience that you have, and I'm sure they're going to be going out in the portal and probably trying to add, you know, a little bit more than they had to the roster this year because mm. you lost uh, two players midway through the season, and that, along with the injuries, uh, severely hampered, you know, what this team could do on a night-in, night-out basis. Not necessarily saying that, uh, you know, Jessica Timmons was was going to add a ton. Uh, Mallory Collier, by the way, was the the fourth player that I missed out on earlier. Another post uh, in the top fifty for NC State going into next year, but. 
they're going to need to have a full roster next year. You're going to need to have more players because if players do decide to transfer in the middle of the season or if you have injuries, you can't just bank on you know, the, the eight players that you have on your roster at that point. Hmm. Uh, and I think that was part of the issue for this team this year was was having to lean on them. And and if they struggled, you couldn't take them out. You, you just have to keep riding with those players. Uh, and I think that's that's part of it for next year is is knowing that you, know, you do have to have a little bit deeper of a roster uh, than they did this year. Ironically, I mean, we, we talked in the past about how Wes has enjoyed an embarrassment of riches. Um, and how do you find enough playing time for, for all these talented athletes? And, and it ended up, he, he needed every one of them and more. Usually he ends up narrowing it down. You know, he has 12, 13 players and he ends up narrowing it down to, you know, seven, eight players that'll see the court for the most part. And then the rest of them will be de- developed for next year. The issue this year is you couldn't really narrow it down. I mean, you end up losing two players midway through the season. You have an in, a major injury to a player that, you know, despite not playing, you know, uh, basically like a third of the season, still ends up getting second team All ACC. Like that's that's how good of a player she was and how important she was to the NC State team. So you get her back, you get you know several players back. I'm sure there will be you know potentially more attrition uh, this off season, or you know you, you obviously you have. Uh, Jakia Brown Turner and Jada Boyd moving on from the program, so uh, there's there's going to be a chance for them to go out in the transfer portal and add more uh, players as well. So I'll, I'll I'll be very interested to see what this offseason looks like for them because I'm sure it's going to be a little different than what we saw last offseason. Yeah, well, we do know that uh, both programs um, are going to have opportunities to uh, to offer you know opportunities to um, yeah. players who are, are looking for a good landing spot, and both have proven that they can be good landing spots for transfers in the transfer portal. The men's team also gets a nice little added uh, scholarship too that they didn't have the past two seasons. So, you know, it's funny. I didn't even think about that, but yep. yeah, the, the last remnant of that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> bizarre, a I I A R P. What was it? Uh, the, the ARP, the GARP, uh, who knows? Um, the, 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 yeah, yeah. The, the the ruling uh, by the the third party committee that proved to be completely worthless. That uh, I guess benefited NC State in that respect. But uh, but yeah, the one the one punishment being that they were dealing with reduced tra- uh, scholarships. And yes, I know we're getting there. Jesus. <laughs> All right, baseball. I, yes. All right. With much demand and much uh, fanfare, we will discuss Trey Turner, uh, the performance he's had at the uh, the World ba- Baseball Classic. Um, you probably have seen, if you're on social media, uh, you've probably seen the clip of Trey uh, hitting an absolute monster of a uh, grand slam and uh, rescuing uh, the USA in that game against Venezuela. Um, but he's he's had a tremendous, you know, classic all around. Um, we, we were joking in between segments that he's he's just what a, a single uh, a, a one a solo run, home run yeah, yeah solo home run short of uh, hitting the uh, the home run cycle he's got a a two a three and a grand slam uh, and just needs a solo to complete that um, you know we we know obviously what a great player Trey is but it's been great seeing someone uh, so many other people outside uh, you know uh, discover Trey for the first time and and see what he was able to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's become a superstar in MLB over the last several years and just signed with the Phillies for a, a massive contract. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, but, man, he is, you know, he's putting himself out there on the world stage right now as well. Uh, and, you know, the, the reactions from from him hitting the home run, uh, you know, the, the fact that it ended up leading them to a win over Venezuela, uh, and then – hitting multiple home runs in the last game. Like this is all just the quarterfinals and the semifinals. Uh, This is not even, you know, during pool play, like the most important games that you could possibly play. And he steps up and that's what he's done on a regular basis throughout his MLB career. That's what he did at NC state as well. So uh, it's just, it's really fun to watch him have that kind of success. Um, And at the same time, you know, it's, it's funny because backtracking a little bit here, one of the main reasons why he wasn't viewed as a potential MOB prospect coming out of, uh, you know, coming out of, uh, of high school, one of the main reasons why he went to NC State was questions about his bat. It was questions about whether or not he could, you know, with his frame, hit consistent home runs, whether or not he could be, you know, a, a constant average hitter 
uh, because they knew he had the speed. They knew he had, you know, all the intangibles. He was going to be a great defensive player, but was he able to do all of those things? And now that's become, you know, one of the, one of the biggest reasons why he's become a superstar in the MLB mm-hmm. is because of his bat is because of the way that he constantly hits for average, just won the batting crown for, you know, a second straight year, maybe third straight year. I don't remember. Um, so all of these things are just unreal to see from him. Yeah. I mean, you typically think of, you know, guys who hit for average is not having a tremendous amount of power or the ability to, you know, just go on a, a, a streak of, you know, powerful performances at the play, just, you know, hitting dingers left and right. But uh, he's got that in him as well. And um, I swore I wouldn't bring this up, but I, I still it breaks my heart that he didn't get that one over the fence in Omaha. I saw uh, somebody <laughs> joke about that. The the grand slam that he hit, I saw somebody retweet it and say, uh, this wouldn't have gone out in TD Ameritrade <laughs> right, Park. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, it was almost the same launch angle and everything, uh, 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 same part of the park. But uh, but yeah, I mean, he, he is really elevating himself into that superstar stratosphere of, of MLB players and uh, getting handsome, handsomely rewarded for it. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, um, it's, it's great to see. And, and, uh, you know, he's, he's had a few viral moments for his slides in the home plate, which is, yes. he, he's kind of custom built to become a star in this era of, you know, social media and, and Finesse. These, yeah, yeah, yeah. These, you know, these, uh, three, four, six second, uh, moments where, whether it's a slide or, or, uh, crushing a grand slam in, in dramatic fashion. I mean, he's, he's a guy who's, who's, made for the moment in those respects and uh so great to see he's 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 something else and and you know he had that um that great moment where he's wearing the uh the nc state football helmet yes. after their win um it clearly loves the wolf pack as well still and then a water polo helmet <laughs> that i i still don't know where that came from uh was that water polo or was that one of those like padded things they put on top of the football helmet no it was, it was a water polo oh, helmet. Was it? Okay. yeah it was All post right. game after the world series after they won it uh, and he was because he needed to wear the shades uh, or the goggles. <laughs> right, so he right. needed something that he could wear. Yeah. Uh, so he wore, I believe he wore a football helmet and then also had that uh, as the post game celebration. Uh, by the way, a note from Chris here. Uh, he said Trey Turner signed an 11 year, $300 million contract uh, with the Philadelphia Phillies. So uh, his, his family is set for life, is like four generations, maybe even five generations down, is set for life. Uh, with that one contract so and and that's not even you know counting in all the money that he's made with the nationals all which wasn't nearly as much as you're gonna make with any other team because the nationals are penny pitchers uh but you know then (laughs) all the money they made with the dodgers too so it's like you know he's he's had an unreal career already yeah Uh, i'm excited to see what he's gonna do with the phillies even though i'm a braves fan so you know he can he can do what he wants to in the regular season let's just not you know keep doing just, the things that he's doing on this stage in the postseason. Yes. You, you wish all the success for Trey Turner, but uh, you hope that his playoff uh, success is limited to, uh, <laughs> to, yes. to the earlier rounds uh, and that the Braves advance. Um, completely understand that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, always exciting to see a guy like Trey uh, succeed and, and uh, he's, he's a good one. So not uh, to take it back to a negative here. Uh, no, the, we were going to end. I know, I know, we were so close. Uh, <laughs> but the the baseball program itself uh, lost the series two to one to uh, to Virginia over the weekend. Uh, but you no, know, a note here from Ben. He said, uh, you know, uh, talk some uh, baseball. Got to give a shout out to Matt and and Fritten talking about Matt Willison and Dom Fritten uh, for the performances they had over the weekend. Really, really encouraged by the starting pitching for NC State over these last several games, over these last several weeks. It's a little frustrating to see the bullpen, you know, reverting back to where it was the beginning of last year. So I'd love to see the bullpen get things back together uh, and the offense kind of get, you know, back in sync. Uh, We'll have to see if that happens against two more top 25 opponents over the next two weekends uh, in Boston College on the road. And then uh, you come back home and face a top 10 Louisville team. So uh, this is a, you know, a baseball team that, you know, we, we talked about it two years ago talking about all right you know they're, they're facing some really tough competition they're going to be better for this down the road uh and that team ended up going to omaha uh i f- not saying this team is going to go to omaha but i feel like don't give up on this team because I, I do feel like they still have a lot of pieces to be able to make a deep run uh, and be able to you know get themselves in that mix but it's just going to take you know these lumps early on for what is a a relatively young team you know outside of your starting pitching 
yeah. it will, and Dom Fritton being a, a true freshman that is starting for you on Sundays too. Yeah, Elliot's going to have us in a mode where we almost are just rooting for the team to kind of struggle a little bit before uh, the season really kind of kicks into high gear and then uh, wait to see the, uh, the the fruits of those uh, difficulties pay off uh, down the year. Sam from right here in the room said you heard it here from Corey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going to Omaha. So. Yeah, yeah. If, you're, uh, if you're listening at home, uh, isolate that audio of Corey calling a shot for the team to go to, uh, to, <laughs> to Omaha. And then, uh, you know. Four or five months from now, uh, you look like a genius. No, because then somebody will say, "Well, he said they. He said uh, d- don't expect the same thing. Don't expect <laughs> them to go to home." No. Yeah, I, I, I do think this team has a chance to be very good. It's just it, it's going through some frustrating times right now. Figuring things out in the ACC offensively uh, can be can be trying. You got a bunch of guys trying to press right now, uh, and I think when you have that breakthrough moment, if they win this series against Boston College this upcoming weekend, that could propel them. Because uh, that is a very tough challenge on the road against a team in Boston College is playing some really good baseball too. Yeah, and I said four to five months. It's it's not that far. No. Uh, we're we're already in the uh, the short rows or or the back half of the season, I guess. Um, so time flies. Um, we won't get into it too much, but keep your eyes peeled on uh, the men's swimming and diving teams as they uh, head off to nationals as well. I'm sure we'll discuss the results of that uh, on next week's show. Yes, uh, but women swimming and diving this past weekend, really strong finish for them, mm-hmm. uh, as well as you know the the men swimming and diving team coming into this upcoming weekend has a chance. I feel like has a chance at you know potentially a top three finish, if not a national championship, going into this weekend. Yeah, so something something to watch uh, heading into uh, this upcoming week. So, all right, well we've we've talked a lot. We enjoyed having Coach Pat uh, Papalitio on in the first segment there, talking some wrestling and their strong performance out in Tulsa. Obviously, disappointing basketball stuff, but uh, ended on a good note uh, here talking about Trey. We and found and, a way. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so, all right. Well, for Coach Pat and for Corey, this is James saying so long here on the Pat Pride Weekly Podcast.